Bar Leaders in the Court of Public Opinion, a presentation by Patrick Jackson. A past president of the Public Relations Society of America, Mr. Jackson is a well-known expert on public relations, particularly as it relates to bar associations. He is an adjunct professor at Boston University. This program was presented by PBA at the 1982 Annual Seminar of the Conference of County Bar Leaders. Public relations is a fit subject, I think, for lawyers because you've all been practicing it for years, whether you knew it or not. One of the difficulties that exists in my experience in working with the bar in attempting to shape its relations with the public, speaking of the public as a large body rather than separate individuals, is a misunderstanding of this whole question of the court of law in which you practice and the court of public opinion in which I and my colleagues practice. I used to think there was a lot of difference and I have to tell you that in recent years I'm coming to think there isn't very much difference at all. It may be useful just to consider, however, the comparisons of the court of law on the one hand and the court of public opinion on the other. In the court of law, as you keep reminding us lay persons, it's facts that are important. We're really dealing with, with fact and nothing that isn't factual is admissible and therefore it's uh, seemingly a very rational, logical process. In the court of public opinion, facts are virtually worthless for the simple reason that in the court of public opinion, an opinion which is inadmissible in your court is a fact. If Mrs. Smith believes something to be so, in the court of public opinion we must deal with it because it is, after all, her perceptions, her opinions, which ultimately become the jury decision, and we have to live with that. Now this apparent conflict between facts and opinions, as I say, is one that I long thought truly differentiated these two courts. The more I think about it, and the more I am involved in dealing with lawyers and with bar associations, the more I realize that even in your daily practice, it's really the opinions that is what you are after and what you're dealing with. And I don't even have to, I think, illustrate that point. All of you who practice before juries know that the facts may be far less important in reaching that jury than in emotional constructions and many other methods that you will use to get across to the jury what you mean and that's the key point that I want to make to you today, is the difference not between facts and opinion, but between facts, hard, single, identifiable, provable items, facts, and meaning. Now the semanticists have a field day with this, but I submit to you that in order to arrive at meaning, one has to deal with probably some fact as a base and a great deal of opinion as the ultimate door to reaching meaning. What do you really want to communicate? And certainly we all know the difficulty of communication. In fact, I was reminded recently of just how, how impossible it can be sometimes despite your best intentions. I was giving a talk to a group in New Orleans. It was a, a group of senior professionals, but they had invited a number of students to attend. And as I was leaving to go to the airport, some students uh, grabbed me, standing by the taxi cab, and asked if they could take my picture. Well, I'm reasonably well known in my field, but not that well. So I thought a minute about what was going on, and then of course I realized that if you invite students to go to a conference in New Orleans, they want to bring home some factual evidence that they in fact attended the conference. So they lined me up next to the cab, and they snapped away, and I got in the cab and zoomed off. Well, just to show the difficulty of factual communication, about two weeks later in the mail I received one of these snapshots. 
And there I was, standing next to the cab with my bald head gleaming in the Louisiana sunshine. And right behind me, the major focus of the picture was one of those big signs that you're apt to see in New Orleans. It was on a building across the street. And what it said was, completely nude dancing. <laughs> now, I have a hunch that is not the message that my young friends wish to send back. And by the way, just to put you at rest, I should tell you that I have written the dean to get them reinstated. <laughs> but I think it illustrates the point that sometimes the facts don't really do the job. And we in public relations are very conscious of this, and I want to share with you today, if I can, some of what we've learned on truly communicating to the public, to the court of public opinion, in a way that will let that court both participate in those issues which concern them, but above all, to understand your positions and your concerns as it affects what you do, and of course, ultimately, what the bar does in our society affects what everyone in the society does. The thing that is probably most important to realize about public relations, if you will, for your associations and for yourselves, is that while opinions are important, and I've made this differentiation of facts and meaning, that there's yet another dimension that the philosophers have pointed out to us, and I think it's still very true. The best definition I know of public relations is this one. For those of you in the back, it reads P plus R equals PR. The P stands for performance. The R for recognition. So that if you have performance and get recognition for it, we know that you then will have good public relationships. One of the difficulties that our profession has had in public relations field is pointing out to people that it is more than just the R. You've got to have the performance first. And I certainly don't want to leave without making that point clear. How do you deal with a crisis, if you will, of public relations nature in the bar or in your bar association? What do you do? What should you do? In order to answer that question, I want to talk just a minute with you about what is a public relations crisis. This is a phrase that's uh, increasingly bandied around today. We have a PR crisis. I would define a crisis, well, let me, let me, let me not define it. Let me throw out a couple uh, of uh, generalizations to you and see what you think a crisis is. First, let's assume we have a situation where something really upsets the members of your organization, or perhaps it upsets you as the leaders. Is that a public relations crisis? By contrast, we have an issue that, that truly has the potential to change public opinion about the substance of how your organization functions or of the role of the bar in society. Is that a public relations crisis? How do you tell which or both of these may be a public relations crisis? I have a definition which may seem odd to you because it's completely operational, but this is what I would say. I would say to you that a public relations crisis is anything that pulls your organization away from doing its primary job. In other words, if it takes your eyes and minds off the goals and the operations for which you exist, then it's a public relations crisis. Therefore, the answer to my posed question is that either of these instances could be a public relations crisis. If something is really upsetting your members, treating your members as a public, you have a public relations crisis because clearly if they're upset about an issue, they're not going to have their minds on the substance of your program. And I think we'd all agree if something has upset the public or has interested them sufficiently, that they may be thinking about some form of action or regulation or what have you that would impair the bar's functioning or the courts, 
or the Constitution, obviously that also is a public relations crisis. Now, what this suggests to me is that your job as bar leaders is to be terribly careful to define public relations crises, supposed public relations crises, with a great deal of accuracy. My experience is that leaders of all organizations tend to jump very quickly and to think that most any criticism, most any group of upset members represent a crisis. And if I can't do anything else with you this morning, I would like to try and convince you that this is not the case and that in fact most of the time we overreact. We overreact to things that are said in the media or that are said by public officials and we overreact to comments from our members. And I would like to share some ideas with you as to how we might be able to avoid that kind of action in the future. And I have a very good reason for urging you to avoid this overreaction. And I can state that in a very simple premise. In my professional practice, about nine-tenths of the crises that I my firm, my colleagues are called upon to deal with were created crises. That is to say, there was no crisis, but the organization so overreacted, the organization itself made it a crisis. Let me give you a simple example. Something appears in the public media, or some public official makes a statement. It contains negative material about your bar association, about one of your leaders or members. What is your instant reaction? What is the instant reaction of most humans on this planet? Respond, give it to them, they're wrong, the facts are not such. Well, possibly in the court of law that's what you should do. In the court of public relations that's an absolute charter for disaster. Let me prove it with a, a current example. There's a bakery in the eastern part of the United States that a certain religious group supposedly owns according to rumor. I'm purposely leaving out the names because I don't want to spread the rumor any further. And the trouble with that is that those of you who already know the rumor at least will get one reinforcer. But I am not going to make the same mistake I'm urging you not to make, okay? This bakery had the good sense to stay quiet to say nothing about this for quite a while. But sooner or later, you know, it, it got to them. It started appearing in the media and people made a couple of jokes on talk shows. And so the first thing they, they did once their tempers got out of hand was to put on a media blitz saying it wasn't so. Some studies were done. The studies showed that while the rumor was a potent one, and the grapevine is certainly the best and fastest and surprisingly accurate communications medium we have, while all that is true, something like five to seven percent of the measurable opinion in this area where the bakery operated had heard the rumor. After the media blitz, 42 percent to 45 percent had now heard the rumor. This is an absolute truism in dealing with crisis. Don't make a crisis where there isn't one. Be very careful of responding because responding is usually overreaction. It's particularly true when you're responding to the media because as they always say, never argue with anybody who buys ink by the barrel. They are apt to have the last word, and I think in this case it's certainly true. Let's assume you have a crisis, that you've uh, really uh, been a responsible official of your association and you've, uh, you've looked at the issue at hand, whatever it is, and you've decided that this has come to such proportions, enough of the members are bothered or there's a strong enough public opinion out there that you really better get into it. You can't just ignore it any longer. There are certain aspects of public crises, of, of the, the show, if you will, in the court of public opinion, that you ought to be aware of 
of because these are the traps when you get into a crisis. The first, and this is sort of a, a rule, if you will, of practice for us, the first thing to realize is that once you have a public crisis, again, forget all that factual business, you are now really in the business of the theater. You are now an actor or actress. Now that's a very difficult role for most of us. It's a difficult role for me as a professional who does this all the time because I'm not, I'm not trained in acting, in simulation, dissimulation, histrionics and all that stuff. I'm, I'm not really at home on the stage. I'd, I'd rather be home picking blueberries than out there in front of the world arguing these points. But suddenly if I'm involved in a crisis, I've got to remember that I am in the theater. Remembering that we're in the theater helps us greatly to deal with crises because there are certain rules of the theater that we can quickly apply to what we do. The first rule of the theater is, of course, that you have to be heard above the footlights. They've got to hear you in the back row. So that implies that when you do participate in an issue discussion, Make every effort to see that your message gets out to all the affected individuals, to all the stakeholders involved. It isn't enough to issue statements. If you're willing to go into a crisis situation, you've got to be willing to go all the way to deal with all the media, with all the forms of expression, and all the people involved. The second thing about theater is that we have to know something about how audiences respond to theatrical performances. As you know, except for a few joke lines and a few really emotional punchers, when we go to the theater, we come away with a general feeling rather than watching the specific language. People who are constantly quoting playwrights have usually done so 